You're listening to Cooper Talk. Welcome to Cooper Talk. I'm your host, Steve Cooper, and remember, I'm only as hip as my guest. I got to tell you something, people. Today, today the weather is 63, and it's overcast, and it's raining. Yesterday, it was 93 and sunny. That's a 30-degree difference. And I was sitting there today, and I was like, you know, this is bull crap. This is awful. But then I thought, it could be worse. Today could have been 33 and yesterday, 63. So you always have to look at the good side of things. Anyway, we have a great show today. My guest, you know, his career, it's unbelievable, has spanned like 50 years, which in, in any entertainment, that's just amazing. And he's a, he's a singer, he's a songwriter, he's a, he's been part of some bands, he's done some solo work, and my guest is Rick Roberts. How you doing, Rick? I'm doing fine. Yes, <laughs> almost 50 years, yes. And there were 20 years before that, too. <laughs> yeah, it, it, Not music, but, you know. You no, know, it, it, it amazes me when I was looking. I mean, you know, I mean, you must have started. Well, first of all, when did you start playing music? When did you get an interest in music? I actually was in my first band as a singer at the age of 15 and started about the same time. I picked up the guitar and thought I'd better start playing an instrument, too. You know, so uh, it was it was a cool thing. Uh, but uh, I, it's funny because I'm left-handed. And the only thing I do right-handed in my whole life is play guitar. And that's because I didn't want to have to. But when I first got into it, I didn't have any idea I'd be getting into it professionally or anything like that. So my main goal was to be able to pick up any guitar that was available and play at Clearwater Beach uh, on Sunday afternoons for the beautiful women that were around there. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, so I learned how to play right. Now, now, what made you get into music, though? What was the uh, the driving force behind it? Like some people say, they wanted to meet girls. Some people said other reasons. What was your driving force? Actually, you know, there were kind of several reasons. One being that in my generation, when the Beatles arrived, and you saw all those wonderful women out there going wild and everything like that, and you were fourteen or fifteen years old with your hormones running wild and everything like that, that's what I want to do. You know, and and as a result. I, I can probably count on one hand the people I know of that I grew up with who didn't want to be in a band. They weren't necessarily thinking of it as a career, but, uh, you know, play some music. But I also, my mom was a childhood star in Detroit on radio. Uh, and uh, I, I wish I could sing as well as she could. She had an incredible voice. And so there was kind of the seeds were there, you know. And uh, as, I, as I got of college age, I went to school, um, they thought I might be a very good criminal lawyer because I had a gift of gab, a command of the language, and a vivid imagination. And I, I, my whole awareness of law at that point was from Perry Mason. <laughs> and I thought, wow, lawyer, that'll be cool. And then I got to college and I found out that 95 plus percent of legal work is paperwork. And you don't get to go out there and investigate crimes and do all this border weird adventurous stuff. And I went, let's see, what else can I do with a vivid imagination, a gift of gab, and a command of the language? And I could write songs, but it wasn't quite that A and B, you know, but but I think somewhere the circuitous path led from that to that. And also, you know, being basically bone lazy, being able to do something that was fun and make a living at it, hopefully, was very attractive. <laughs> yeah, so. Well, you know, you know, it's just funny, you know, we say, I know a lot of people say, you know, like you said, lazy, but you know, a lot of people don't understand what goes into work as in musicianship. I mean, my, my brother was a great drummer. My sister played the cello and the French horn. I tried to play the guitar and I sucked and I didn't have the discipline. And that's the thing, like for you learning to play guitar and, and writing, it had to take some discipline. Well, you know, in all honesty, and, and putting all the shuck, all shucks more things aside, yeah, but music is, is a very hard way to make a living. And also, the constant the tightrope you're walking, uh, trying to, you know, get past all the rejection that comes, especially early on, and maintain some modicum of, of self-confidence or and belief in yourself. You know, when, when people are telling you, nah, not, you know, I mean, when I went to Los Angeles to, to actually pursue a career in music, uh, actually, I thought I'd been discovered. I was in Washington, D.C., living here, this area, and uh, where I am now, uh, on rehearsal things, uh, but I 
was living here, and uh, I played uh, what was then called Hoot Nannies. Now they call them open mic nights, whatever. But uh, I played one of those in D.C., and a guy came up to me and he said, uh, you're pretty good. I'd like to make a record with you. And I said, well, do you do that sort of thing? And he said, well, yeah, you may have heard of me. My name is Paul Wellchild, who produced Janis Joplin and The Doors. And I thought, wow. I said, yeah, I've heard of you. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we went through all the thing. He told me how I, I need to get to Los Angeles because that's where he was based. And then we worked from there. So I went, I hitchhiked all the way across country to Los Angeles, and I uh, went to his house, he gave me a address and everything, knocked at the door, and this guy comes out, I said, I'm here to see Paul. He said, I'm Paul. I said, no, 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 you're not. He said, yeah, I am. <laughs> and and my, my dreams went right down the tubes in about 30 seconds, because the guy in D.C. was a fake guy, but he was not Paul Rothschild. <laughs> and so... Uh, through one thing or another, I decided as long as I was there, I would go ahead and give it a shot. And I spent the next year doing auditions for all these record companies, and they all said, hey, you know, you're pretty good, let's do a demo. And I thought at that point, hey, a demo, I'm in, boy, not realizing that they were throwing money around like crazy in those days, and doing a demo with nothing. So I did 15 or 20 of those, whatever number, and was just about almost ready to give up. And I went back to Columbia Records for the second time uh, to kind of do a favor for a friend of mine who worked as a liaison man between UCLA and the company. Uh, he said, please, please come back, man. I really think you're good. And if I could get you signed, you know, I want to be an A&R guy for, for them. And if I could get you signed, that would be a great feather in my cap. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll do it. I went back. And I played a few songs for their new head of A&R. And you know, for anyone who does, that would be the people who actually sign acts, artists, and repertoire. Yeah, but uh, nonetheless, I played a few songs for this guy, and he said what I heard so many times before, you know, you're a good singer, a good songwriter, but you need a band. And he picked up his phone. I thought, that's kind of a rude way to end the interview. And I started to pack my guitar. He said, what are you doing? Sit down. I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm getting your band. I said, huh? And it turned out then that uh, he... Uh, he explained to me after the phone call that, that the Burrito Brothers had parted company with Graham Parsons uh, not too long before that, and we were just knocking around, not doing too much, and they might be willing to back me on a record. So we, we set it up, and uh, I went to actually to see if they w were interested in doing this. And I walked in and said, okay, yes, look, uh, this song is in, in A minor, and da da da. They said, well, wait, do you know uh, the race is on? I said, no, no, because I didn't know any country music at all. I mean, I, I never liked country music as a kid. And uh, I said, but anyway, this song, and they said, wait, but do you know uh, the race is on? She thinks I still care. Do you know that? No, do you know uh, almost. You know, I mean, all of a sudden, after about 15 minutes, Chris Hillman says, you're the most ill-prepared guy for an audition I ever saw. And I said, audition? Because they thought I'd come to audition to join the band. And so we work at direct cross purposes. But once we got on the same page, it was working pretty well. So uh, I, you know, I did a trial gig with them at the Whiskey of Go-Go, which was very same as those days. It's different players now. But nonetheless, and... and we decided it would work. And, uh, you, you know, you mentioned before 50 years. <laughs> it's odd because I got into that band, and that band was consisting, it consisted of uh, Chris Hillman and Michael Clark from the original Birds, and Bernie Levin from Dillard Clark and Led to the Eagles, of course, um, and Sneaky Pete, who was one of the most highly regarded session musicians in Los Angeles, and me, who was literally fresh off the streets. I, I'm making my living for the last six months, feeding myself by sitting in the Free Press bookstore in Westwood, playing guitar with a bucket in front of me. And from there, I'm suddenly with all these professional guys. And I was really, I mean, the classic, uh, classic new kid on the block and all that stuff. And now, <laughs> I'm the old guy. People get a, oh, yeah, Robert, he's been around forever, yeah. But, and, and, and by the way, those guys that we just never let me forget. That was a new kid, you know? Now, Now, what was it like when you said you played the whiskey that night? Because, you know, I, I'd been to the whiskey when I lived in L.A., and, and it's not what it used to be, And but it, it was legendary. What is that like as someone who's, you know, wants to be a, mus who's a musician that's looking for that break? You've been getting, the, you know, you've been getting turned down, but what was it like to hit that stage? Because, you know, th those were the days when the whiskey was, like, 
the place. Right, that, that was where all the major experts. But uh, you know, I actually, my my head exploded a couple of times that evening. I mean, I was playing my first gig with a a national known recording band. You know, guys who made records. Because you know, as you probably know, in those days, it was a whole different thing. It's like being able to make a record was a, a privilege reserved for very few people. The record companies controlled the game, and if you could get contracted, if you could get signed, then you could make a record. That was great, but they were the massive filter for everything. There was no Pro Tools, there was no making records in your garage, like that, for a thousand bucks. You know, you, nobody could afford to make their own record. So, very few people, you could walk around and say, I'm a recording artist, and that was a status of thing. But now, Everybody's there. Anybody who wants to, you know, people who should not be singing outside their shower have records out, you know, and then stuff like that. So it, it's changed entirely. But, but as I said, I was there playing with a national recording act and all that with two guys who were one of the major influences on my music as, as a, an adolescent and all that. Uh, my favorite bands in those days were the Birds, Buffalo Springfield, the Beatles, or the Beach Boys, or I called them the Bees. You know, all, all B, B bands. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, you know, here I was with them on stage, and we were opening for the current version of the Birds in those days. And, uh, you know, so it was just, uh, as, as they used to say, a mind-blowing experience, you know. But, uh, but the whole thing, in fact, with those guys, I mean, I, I was coming in with, with a generation ahead of me, I, you know, entering into the game with, with guys who were already a step ahead. And as a result, within six months or a year, I had met all these other people I had only seen on record album covers before, you know, and, and being able to sit down and have conversations with them and everything like that, and, and, and trade songs back and forth. And, and I'm going, what's going on here, <laughs> you know? So, yeah, it was definitely, it was life-altering. So you play with the Burrito Brothers for what, uh, three, two, three years? Uh, actually, it was about about two years, really. I, I joined in September of 1970. Yeah, so I think so. And I was with them until the band broke up at the beginning of 72, at their January, February of 72. Although there were a few holdovers, uh, there, you know, there was a, a tour of Europe that we had been contracted for, and then the band broke up, and the voters in Europe, because the Burritos were, were like a, a B-level band here, if you will. We, we had records, but no big hits. We couldn't fill an arena or anything like that. Uh, but in Europe, the Burritos were superstars. In fact, they outpulled the Rolling Stones one year for most popular band they, in Holland. And, and I mean, so we were over there, and I mean, everywhere we went, was, you know, all that stuff that you, you see here with Lady Gaga and, and, and you know, that, that level of megastar. And uh, so that that was pretty amazing. But the promoters said we would not let us out of the, the, the contract of tour. And Chris Hillman and Al Perkins, who had taken Sneaky's place, uh, had already joined Stephen Sills' Manassas band. Michael Clark had hightailed it for um, Hawaii to retire for a while, he thought. And, uh, and Bernie was doing his first stuff with what was to become the Eagles and like that. So the only guy left from the previous band that had been to Europe and such was myself. So the management team hit on me pretty heavily and said, Rick, please, please do this. We're all going to get sued, you know. And I said, okay, well, uh, you know, and, and they put good people together. They, they put me with uh, the Country Gazette who had been on the last Rio album, but had not yet been to Europe, so they were strangers to Europe, but they were actually burrito guys, you know, by that. And they added a pedal steel player and a drummer from uh, the large number of uh, country rock type bands that were functioning out in LA at that time. And uh, we went and we did, did that tour, and it went over very well. In fact, the, the Country Gazette ended up going back there eight or ten times over the next decade and becoming superstars in their own right. But, uh, you know, so there were holdovers. But it was all in all, it was nearly two years. So know. so when you broke up with them, is that when you got to record your your two solo albums? Yeah, 
but I, I kind of continued with AM Records. Uh, you know, I signed a new contract and all, but that was it was direct outshoot of my involvement with the Britos. And then after the second album, uh, the second album didn't even get within shouting distance of the charts. And of course, that's what they pay attention to at the companies. So I knew I was going to get dropped. And having had the experience before of being told, yeah, good sir, good sir, but you need a band, I figured I'd have a band for this time. So that's when I put Firefall together. It was, in fact, it started off as being Rick Roberts and Firefall. And they were their function. It was going to be like Linda Ronstadt's bands, you know, a lot of good players, but it was it was her thing, you know. I thought this was going to be my thing, but as it turned out, the the most interested label passed on us, and then that kind of eliminated our reason for being. So the band was, well, I guess well, there's no reason for us to have to wait a minute, you guys, hold on. Why did I drop my name? We'll just make it Firefall. And like, because this is a good band, you know, and it was a good band. So from there, you know, it, it took its own direction. Now, how did you come up with the name Firefall? Say again, I'm sorry? How did you come up with the name Firefall? Well, I had heard, I'd heard of the event which takes place up in uh, Yosemite Park. There is a, a, a falls, I, I always forget the name of the falls, and I really should know it by now, but they, they have something called the Firefall, or they did for a long time, uh, up until 1968. Uh, what it is, there is a falls, like I said, up there, that for two weeks in the month of February, with the seasons and all that, the, the angle of the sun on the earth, everything, for those two weeks, the sun hits this falls at an exactly proper angle, and you look at it, and it looks like liquid fire coming down of the falls. And it got the nickname, the firefall. And I'd heard of that. I just liked the sound of it and the imagery, so that's how I did the band. So you got the band together. Now, how is the... What is the record company's response to you? Are they are they excited or what what are they feeling? Well, actually, the way the thing came about, we sent out demos uh, to a number of labels, you know, to to see if, if there was interest, and there was some interest, but nothing, you know, earth shaking at that point. And Firefall was playing around the region, around Colorado and Wyoming, and you know, Utah and like that, mostly around Colorado. And uh, we were not playing enough to keep us all fed and with roof over our heads. So we were doing other things. Larry Burnett was going on to solo work. Michael Clark was kind of a gun for hire, playing drums for whoever wanted, you know, a drummer for the night. And, uh, you know, just various things we were doing. And Chris Hillman came to me and he said, can I borrow you and Jock Bartley and Mark Andes to go out on a tour with me as the Chris Hillman band? So we said, sure. And it was good to last about a month. About three weeks in, we were headed to New York City to do a weekend at the other end in, in the village there. And uh, Chris was feeling terrible and had been for a couple of days. So we went to a doctor when we got there. Doctor said, you have hepatitis. You go home. And, you know, not, by the way, not the needle kind, just the kind that you get, you know. Uh, and so... Uh, he said, well, we got a three-day show here, or a three-day run here in New York. I, I don't want to leave them in the lurch. Can I do tonight at least? So the doctor gave them permission to do the, the Thursday night, I guess it was, and then fly back on Friday. Meanwhile, I went to Paul Colby, the old owner, and the breeders had played there a couple of times. And I said, Paul, listen, you've got three-fifths of my band Firefall here right now. Can I fly Michael Clark and Larry Burnett in, and we'll do the weekend as Firefall? They're Therefore, you wouldn't have to go dark for the weekend. And Paul Colby said, sure, do it. And our manager called Atlantic and said, hey, you said you were interested in these guys. They're playing here in New York, so you can go see them. So they did, and they were knocked out. And they said on the spot, they said, we want you guys. Let's, let's get started on negotiations right now. So that's kind of how that came about. And they were, they were excited about us. And I had met up with Amit Erdogan a couple of times. And I only found out later that Amit had told people they thought it was going to be his new Stephen Stills, which I, I wasn't by any stretch. Neither the guitar player, nor even though I, I would like to think of myself as colorful, I'm, I'm not quite as eccentric as Stephen <laughs> is known to be. 
nonetheless, uh, so Ahmed was behind the project and everything, and as it turns out, he did very well in that uh, the first Firefall album went gold faster than any record in Atlantic history. That includes Led Zeppelin, that includes Aretha Franklin, all those wonderful acts that they had through all the years. That first art club, just, that went faster than it had before, and right after it came the Foreigner album, which, which came, was this fast, or then faster than any of the records before. But we were both signed the same year. So it, it worked out very well right at the beginning, you know, and uh, or from the very beginning, you know, it, it went, well, for a while. Well, how how did that feel? You know, because you you were very close, as you said. They're always like, get a band or do this or do that. How did it feel when that was your first taste of pretty big success? Because it sold so fast. How does that make you feel as an artist? Well, it's it's really good, but I'll tell you, it's, it's kind of confusing because you know, I mean, there's really there should be a feeling of, of being proud of yourself and like that, but. It gets very, I don't want to say, yeah, I guess I could say, it gets kind of corrupted in the fact that you 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 get proud, you get prideful rather than proud, you know, you get, you get a very big head, you get an inflated sense of your own importance in the world. It's very difficult not to. People all around you are telling you how wonderful you are and all this stuff, and, and you're all just kids, you know, and even if you have been around the block a few times, which Michael Clark had and Mark Andes had, and I had too by that time. I had like four albums under my belt in a couple of years, a few years actually, uh, and uh, like that, but still, when, when you suddenly have the success immediately like that uh, it's really hard to keep a level head about it yeah, and it, uh, we all we fell into traps of that stuff you know got my fancy cars and stuff and yeah it's, it's, I'll tell you what it's really an unfair world in the sense of, of music and athletics because you're taking a bunch of kids who mostly are coming from middle class or lower class backgrounds, you know, because the upper class kids went to the Ivy League schools and then went to the Dad's Corporation or something. It's it's kids who are, you know, from, from middle class and, and lower that, that generally pursue sports or, or music or something like that. And what I'm getting around to is, that, that that's a generalization I know, but what I'm getting around to in general is that most of us were young and we didn't have a background that really uh, prepared us for dealing with a lot of money thrown in our face in a hurry. And th that's why a lot of musicians and a lot of athletes, they make tremendous amounts of money in a very short time and manage to blow it all. <laughs> you know? Well, it is. It is so funny. I agree with you because I remember when I was, I you know, when I, I read, and this is weird to say this, but I, I heard an article about Justin Bieber. The only reason I bring him up is because my wife had done in L.A. had worked uh, make a wish uh, make a wish events, and he was. She said he was so great to the kids, and everyone gave him a hard time because he was driving a Ferrari at you know 140 miles per hour. But you're thinking, if you were 17 and you had a ton of money and you just got off your plane and someone said, "Hey, you want to take this Ferrari for a spin?" You're damn right you would do it. I'll tell you what, you know, Andy Gibb was a good friend of ours. Andy had his white Ferrari. Larry Burnett bought a Ferrari in our bed. And for me, I had my Mercedes 450 SL and my BMW 530i. Yeah, you do that stuff. And, and you look back 20 years later and you go, what was I thinking? You know, and, and there are there are some people. There are some in the musical community. And there, by the way, it, the factor in, in that era was greatly complicated by the massive amount and accept, acceptance of drugs. You know, I mean, we were all doing, not all, but most of us were doing tremendous amounts of, of controlled substances, you know, and things like that. And that doesn't clear your head for any important business decisions either. But, you know, but there are exceptions. I know some guys who were putting their money away from the very beginning and are now just rolling in clover, so to speak. And then others, I mean, the saddest story I ever heard was when I found out that Sly Stone, with all the commercial success that they had and everything, Sly was living in a van. You know, I mean, just all through his hands and gone. Not to mention that there were, I mean, you hear all the stories, but the crooked business managers and like that were a fact. There were a lot of guys out there that, you know, they, they were very smart, clever guys. They figured, let's 
see, there's a lot of money coming through here. How can I get a piece of this action? And so they became managers and things, you know. And, and I'm not saying all managers are bad. There's some great ones, too. But, but that, that was a very attractive field for some people who were silver-tongued devils, so to speak, you know. Now, now you, game. you mentioned about, you know, there was a lot of substance abuse. Did that affect? Oh, yeah. Did that affect your writing at all? I mean, how did that affect you? Your performing well, and your writing. Actually, you're kind of asking the wrong person because I've seen a lot of people did very bad things to you. But for me, if the truth were known, which it get kind of is, because I could make no secret of it, uh, I wrote all my hit songs wired to the girls on cocaine. I mean, I just you know, but most people I knew when they when they have a few lines, they want to go out and party and pick up women and all that stuff. All I wanted to do was get with my guitar and start writing. And uh, I just, you know, it just sort of opened a channel for me. And so I'm one of the few people you'll probably ever meet that turned a profit on cocaine without dealing. <laughs> so but so I did, I did massive amounts of cocaine. So, so it did, it did not really hurt but it actually though it was a temporary thing because it, it used to be I sniff right sniff right sniff right and then it got to be sniff sniff right sniff sniff right and at a point in time it got sniff 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 <laughs> sniff sniff and that's when I stopped doing it okay because there was no longer any purpose in doing it yeah now you said you wrote you know your coked up a lot writing but after the first album of firefall does does well you get your second yeah. album your second album does really well was was you did cocaine help you as you wrote for that second album because there must have been a, a, an am amount of pressure on you guys because when everyone has a good solo a for good debut album you got to follow it up I agree with you, and I'll tell you the truth. The almost universal truth is that second albums for most of the artists I know are not as good as the first one. But part of that, there is the pressure, of course, and the fact that people are now paying attention. You don't have the element of surprise on your side anymore. But the thing is, uh, with the first album, you have the choice of material that you've been writing for years, and you pick the best of that. The second album, you have whatever almost made the grade for the first album and whatever you've written in the subsequent eight or ten months or whatever it is with the albums. So, you know, therefore, I mean, there's, there's a natural uh, handicap on there, you know, and like that. But, uh, yeah, I, I actually, I've made use successfully of cocaine through the first three or four albums, and then, then it started slowing down. But, uh, yeah, I, I mean, the, 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 there's a great, well, a great, it's an interesting story, I, I think, about the song Just Remember I Love You, because I had, uh, after the first album, we were making the first album in Florida. We lived in Colorado, but we went to Florida to make the album at Criteria Studio. I met a young lady down there, and I fell head over heels in love, and I invited her to come back and live with me in Colorado. So, after some things, we did that. She came out. We we drove from Miami out here, and uh, you know, so you know, she had not really been exposed to my whole life and, and all that stuff. So I used to write in in binges. I'd be four or five days. I'd get a couple hours of sleep at night. Spend the rest of the night. I'd be writing. You know, and then go to bed at dawn. Sleep until ten. Get up. You know, whatever. Uh, and uh, so on one such binge. Uh, she was heading off to bed, and she stopped on the stairs and said, Are you coming to the bed with me, or you got to sit there with your tar and your cocaine again all night? And I really <laughs> cannot, I can't imitate the venom that was in her voice. I, you know, i just not capable of it. But I knew that I was in very, very deep trouble if I didn't have something really good for her. I wrote that song, Just Remember I Love You, in its finished form, between the time she went to bed and the time she got up. And when she came down... She said, well, what have you been doing? I said, come on, I'll play something. I played it for She said, that's pretty good. I said, yeah, I think so too, you know. <laughs> and so I avoided serious physical harm by, you know, uh, you know. So, but normally songs don't come that quick very easily, you know, but, but this was self-defense. <laughs> I, I, I knew I was fighting for my life right there. Yeah. 
Now, as you guys are getting bigger, you know, the second album's big, who are you touring with, and, and what's the road like for you? Well, you know, uh, when we, okay, when we started out, it's, it's an odd thing, because, you know, we, we started off with a big splash, we had records hit the charts right away, our very first uh, single was Living Ain't Living, and that charted into the top 50, I don't remember the exact position, but, uh, but you know, it made some noise, and like that, and... We really had a lot of offers and everything, but due to the fact that both Michael and I had been in the Breeders country rock band, and Jock had been with Graham Parsons' band, uh, the Fallen Angels, uh, promoters took it for granted that we were a country rock band. So our very first major tour, I mean, we'd done dates with some important people, you know, like that, uh, well-known people, but uh, our first major tour was headlined by Willie Nelson, and below him was Jerry Jeff Walker, and then Asleep at the Wheel, and then us. Uh, except the way they, they had us on stage was Asleep at the Wheel, opened the show, and then us, and then Jerry Jeff, and then Willie. But... Uh, that only lasted a few nights because we were touring through places like El Paso, Tucson, Bakersfield, serious country music places. And these people would come in, they'd get there a little late, expecting, you know, some some good old country, and be here with, oh, way rock and roll. Because Hardfall, in spite of our singles having primarily been more melodic things and all that, we... we rocked on stage you know we had we had some you know like mexico and things like that off the first album and living and living you know those are more rock and roll but people that came were not prepared for that and so after about and, and they let us know they were not <laughs> prepared for that so after about four shows we were the promoters of the concert tour and asked them if they could switch us with a sleep at the wheel uh, and put us first at Dennis of the Wheel because, you know, that way when two came in a little late, they were greeted with what they expected to be greeted with. <laughs> and we got off, once again, with no physical damage. You know? <laughs> but uh, other than that, uh, I'm not sure. I can't say exactly when the big change came, but we became, and this is the, the, the the exact, or not the exact words, maybe I'm paraphrasing, but Kenny Loggins, who was very big at the time, uh, we went on tour with him four or five times uh, as his opening act. And uh, on one flight, our business manager was sitting next to him in the airline seat and uh, said, Kenny, why do you keep having Firefall come on tour with you? Because the thing is, the band was really a very good live band and was giving the acts we opened for a run for their money. And oftentimes, we only did one or two tours and I'd say, well, we don't really need them for ticket sales anymore, so let's get somebody that we don't have to push so hard ourselves, you know, to make sure we're, you know, so don't let the opening act be the start of the show. Uh, and Kenny's answer, why he kept asking us, that was, he said, best buy the business, because open acts don't make a whole lot of money and so you know he was happy to have us but when the change came we became a really successful opening act we, we went and toured extensively with the michael mcdonald doobie brothers with uh freewood mac we did the whole whole rumor tour as their opening act uh heart we toured with a bunch when they were at their hottest um marshall took them in when they were on a, a non-stop string of single hits uh you know a lot of you and there's many more that I'm, I'm forgetting i know but but yeah we were up there with with a lot of really fine acts and as a result we were doing almost exclusively arena acts and in fact it was tactically it was a big mistake for us we should have been out there headlining in smaller venues and building our own audience because as a result of opening for all these major... Oh, we, did, we did the farewell tour of the band, which is one of my favorite things of our whole career. But uh, nonetheless, uh, you know, the audiences that came, they were coming to see that headliner for the most part. So we, you know, we won some fans over, but nonetheless, those were devoted fans of the headlining act. And, you know, we should have been, as I said, establishing our own fan base. And so... It provided some headaches and some problems for us down the line when we decided it was time for us to go to headlining our own shows. You know, it, it, we didn't didn't have the, the fan base to to make that jump as as smoothly as we would 
like to have. Now, when you look back at it, do you think it was a uh, it was a lapse by management? Because you guys were selling albums. You know, you had gold, you had platinum. I, I attribute a lot of it. A lot of it was our fault because we, we had a lot of internal bickering and things like that. And we had a drug and a non-drug faction of the band. I won't necessarily go into all the names. You know, I'm not going to out anybody, but I can talk about myself. But, you know, but nonetheless, there was, there was arguing about that. And, uh, you know, it, it wasn't really affecting the performance very much, but there were a few occasions, and I'm happy to say I was not the one who did this, but there were a couple of occasions where one of the guys just couldn't, even get to the gig, you know, like that, and, and that was a bad thing. And and there was another couple of times when uh, we were suddenly informed that a guy had had this or that happen and was in the hospital, you know, and and those created a lot of inner tension. But in fact, it 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 translated to musical energy on stage, and that was a good thing. But I also attribute a very large portion of it to the fact that we were the worst decision making group in the world. And we shot ourselves a foot more times than any foot you have to go through. Uh, and we had consistently bad management from the beginning. We had one good manager, and one of the guys succeeded in blowing him off, just alienating so much that he exited. After that, we had a succession of really poor managers. And managers who were in it to get some money out of it, or managers who had no plan. And, and we turned down some really remarkably good managers. Larry and I were talking about it this morning. There was a, there was a point when uh, we were looking for managers and the word went out. And uh, we had Shep Gordon, who did, uh, I guess he did Kiss and Anne Murray was him. And uh, and Peter Grant, who made us the Rolling Stones. And, and one or two other heavyweight people with, with really megastar acts like this and the band found one reason or another to say nah can't do that with the rolling stones believe it or not the excuse that went through the band was we don't want to play second fiddle to another act that the manager has the rolling stones i guarantee you (laughs) you whoever you are you're gonna end up playing second fiddle to them with your management because you know they're the rolling stones you know and like that but and and with uh, with Shep Gordon, who managed to kiss and Amber, the band said, "Well, they're nothing like us, you know. Right? How would he do with a band like us? He wouldn't know what to do." But I mean, all these excuses—they were really lame. And and I blame myself partially for that because you know, as I said, it started off as Rick Roberts and Firefall, and it was my band. But when I took my name away from it, I implicitly made it a democracy. And from then on, everybody in the band felt required to have their two cents worth in on every issue, whether they knew anything about it or not. And so the band, internally, we couldn't agree on anything. We should do this. No, we should do this. No, we should do this. No, we should do this. And, it, you know, it was very confusing for a while. Now, you guys ended up, you left the band. Um why, how did that happen, and, and why did it happen? Did you just say that did the bickering get too much? Did the drugs get too much? Was it just uh, time uh, to go the on? Way it, the way it came down is, on timeline to, uh, is that first, uh, Mark Andes left. He announced he was leaving after the fourth album, while we were doing the fourth album. And he said it was time for him to move along. And he said he was having trouble playing with Michael Clark. And uh, Michael had been giving the band some, some problems so we suggested that he make his that's at the same time and we would say that it was by mutual agreement and all that you know and it, we, therefore leaving him some dignity and, and you know like that and uh, so those two left after the fourth album and we replaced them with uh, George Grantham uh, I'm sorry well, uh, George Hawkins George Grantham was a drummer from Poco uh, George Hawkins and Tris Imboden who had been Kenny Loggins in the section and they were tremendous players, but there was a loss of chemistry there. And we did the fifth album with them, and uh, at that point, I was in kind of a writing slump. Larry was also in kind of a writing slump. Larry was never tremendously prolific. He just came up with wonderful songs, you know, when you least expected it, but like that. But nonetheless, uh, it was the first album where we ever used any outside material. And on that album, I think I had three songs, which is my all-time low, among the five. And Larry had one half of one song, and uh, the rest was was either a couple of 
Well, the guys, the band came up with a couple things. But the Firefall sound had been based in the sound of Larry's and my songs. So it changed that rather dramatically. And also, like I said, the outside material, which of course didn't sound like Firefall stuff, you know. And uh, so at that point, I decided it was time for me to go. And at that point, the band broke up. But about six or eight months later, Atlantic Records called Jock Barley back, and they said, look, we know Rick doesn't want to do this anymore, but there's still a lot of money to be made, same old driving force. There's still a lot of money to be made with this name. Would you like to take on the name? So Jock called me and said, Rick, I have the name. I, I said, yeah, you know, uh, I sold it to him, actually. You know, and later found out that it really wasn't mine to sell because when we signed the contract, we were not a corporation, we were a partnership. Therefore, he would have had to, to legally own the name. He would have had to buy it from each of the other guys, you know, like that. Anyway, that's all just legal niceties, one way or the other. Uh, then Jock uh, took on the name, and he went through, oh boy, I think about 20-something musicians during the, the span of the 80s. Uh, I went back for like four years at the end of the 80s. I, in the meantime, I had had uh, the two band projects. I, I, I spent the early part of the decade uh, with a, a group called the 20th Anniversary Salute to the Birds, which was really an amazing group of people. It was Gene Clark and Michael Clark from the original band. It was Blondie Chaplin from the... Beach Boys and Rolling Stones. It was John York from the latter version of the Birds, and Rick Danko and Richie, uh, Richard Mayo from, from the band. And I mean, Man for Man is probably the best band I was ever in my life. But we went out for a year and a half, two years, I did that. And then I formed a band. Uh, I, I decided, that, you know, that was too much. It was, I was not in control. I like being in some amount of control with my bands. So I put a new band together with Randy Miser, who had just left the Eagles. Uh, it was called the Roberts Miser Band. And that was never recorded, but, uh, but we spent about three years together playing all over the country and, and a good band. But in 1988, I guess, Jock partly called me back and asked if I was interested in coming back to the Brio, to the uh, Firefall Band. And I said, well, yeah, I guess, you know, so, uh, so I commuted from California to Colorado to rehearse for a while, and then still lived in Colorado and just commuted to wherever the band was playing, you know, but I spent another three and a half, four years with them, but at the time, I was drinking a great deal, way too much, and so by mutual consent, I left the band in 1992. And uh, that the band Firefall still exists, and Mark Andes and David Muse from the original band are back with it. And uh, you know, so so that pretty much counts for everybody. Those three are there. Larry are doing this, and Michael Clark has passed away. Uh, so that's the six of us. Yeah, that we're all still in pretty good terms, you yeah. know, like that. But, in well, fact, Firefall about eighty percent of their show is still my song. That's so. funny. Um, I want to ask you though. I, I've written your bio, and uh, you know you've, you've you've written for people stuff like that. But it says in two two oh six you had a, a, a debilitating brain injury. What happened, and how did you come back? Because you're playing again. Well, I would love to tell you something big and noble and all that stuff, but in fact, our dogs were puppies then. My wife and I, our dogs had chewed up a pen and got an ink all over our rug. So we put a little rug over on the carpet there to hide the thing until we get a carpet cleaner in. And the dogs have been playing around. I walked up down the hall one morning and got my feet tangled in the ruffled up rug and hit my head on the corner of our kitchen island. And uh, I sub suffered a subdual hematoma. And I couldn't couldn't walk. I couldn't walk without assistance for about four years. But I couldn't. I was in a wheelchair for about two years. And uh, I, you know, they gave me about a 50-50 chance of relearning to walk. And that's what it was. I had to relearn to walk, like a toddler. I had to master the skill again. And it was no fun. But I, the good news is, I, I wrote a book about it, and I have that. The book's called Lame Brain, and uh, so that's out there, you know. But. Uh, Nonetheless, you know, it was, I learned a few lessons like patience. I'd never had patience in my life. And trying to recover from a brain injury and 
recover certain lost skills uh, is something that will teach you patience whether you like it or not. And as far as playing, uh, yeah, for the first five or six, seven years after my injury, I, I couldn't play at all because I hit the left side of my head. And as you probably know, the left brain controls the right side of your body and vice versa. So my left brain, my my courting was fine. But my strumming was, was terrible. I mean, I, you know, I, I'd say to my mom, okay, do this. And mom would say, you talking to me, sucker? Yeah. <laughs> it, was a, it was an adversarial relationship, to say the least. So, so you know, I, I just, I'd pick up the guitar and be so frustrated with the 15 minutes by what I couldn't do, that I'd always been able to do, that I'd put down the guitar and not pick it up again for six weeks. And then finally, a couple of years ago, uh, a local music store owner in, in Longmont, Colorado, where I live, outside of Boulder, um, came to me and asked me how to do a house concert for them. And I said, well, I'm not really playing much. He said, look, I, I've heard that you, you play a few songs, right? I said, well, there's a few songs I can play. He said, well, all you've got to do, come play three or four songs. So all you have to do is about 90 minutes and tell your stories. You've got so many great stories. And I said, well, I guess I could do that. So I committed to it. But as we got close to the time, I realized in an hour and a half on stage, I couldn't just play four songs. So I, I sat down with my guitar and tried something different. Instead of being frustrated and all that by what I couldn't do, I decided to concentrate on what I could do. So I went through my whole catalog of stuff, found out what I could even start to play. So I simplified a few songs, you know, to, to with the rhythm instructions, and, uh, and found that I was more than able to come up with about 20, 20 songs. And uh, I started doing some house concerts around. And uh, that, in fact, is what eventually led to what uh, Larry and I are doing now. Larry has been playing around with a small convo, probably actually going between one other guy, Don Chapman, who's his harmony singer and the guitar player, a great player, a great guy, uh, and a combo consisting also of a bass player and a, a guy who plays pedal steel and dobro and mandolin and like that. But anyway, Larry has been working around this area, and uh, he called me a few months ago, and he said, hey, Rick, I'm, I'm doing a show down in Norfolk, and they want an opening act, uh, or another act, or whatever, would you like to do a show with me? And I said, well, yeah. So we, we set that up where we were going to do kind of a package thing where I would do my show or, or you know, a set, then he would do a set, and then we would go together and do some of the things we sang together with Firefall. And uh, so Don Chapman started putting in a few uh, advertisements for things, and an agent contacted us saying, hey, are they interested in doing any work beyond that? And we said, well, yeah. So we ended up signing with an agent, and uh, now we're doing more ongoing work and we hope it's going to develop into something really nice we've been rehearsing and it, it, it sounds good it's fun and so we have high hopes for the whole thing well you'll be your i know you're playing uh in new york october 10th and you have a few dates coming up what 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 crowd what kind of crowd do you expect firefall people or just people who are looking for a new sound or for, for well, flying burrito well, brothers i think there'll be some of both i think that maybe you know it, both of Burritos and Firefall are pretty strong in New York City. We're also doing Norwalk, Connecticut, and Plymouth, Massachusetts. And Firefall was never particularly strong in New England, but the Burritos were. So I think it's going to vary from, from place to place. Uh, I think some places will draw people that are more interested in Firefall. Of course, Firefall had the, the much greater uh, commercial success. On the other hand, the, the Fly Breed Brothers are more a piece of history, if you will. Uh, not so much for me. Graham Parsons, of course, is a cult figure, you know, and, uh, you know, but, uh, but they still, they occupy a place in the, the rock history, so to speak, which commercial success does not alone buy you, you know. Uh, so, so there's, there's a, 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 a split. There's, there's people, I think, that are going to come uh, looking for some of both. And uh, we hope we're, we're going to try to give them a, a taste of this, that, and, and some newer stuff too that, that is from neither of those bands, you know. Because we haven't stopped writing just because we don't have those bands anymore. <laughs> now, now you you're still writing. How has has your writing style changed for what you write by for yourself compared to what you write for Firefall? And I know you've written for other people, so. Um, you know, I I wouldn't say. Change 
changed exactly. Larry, Larry, you know, from from the position from the outside, the the you know person, I can say that his style is still very recognizable. Myself, um, I I would not. I don't know how to define what my style was because if you listen to some of the stuff, you know, I you know I wrote Mexico, I wrote Strange Way, and then by the other hand, I wrote You're the Woman, which is way more pop, <laughs> and and, uh, and I wrote uh, you know, I mean, uh, some of the other stuff is just a whole other side of things, and what I have found, uh, and this is kind of a broader thing. I found that, you know, I'm not writing as much as I used to. And then yeah, I've talked to other composers who told me the same thing was true with them. Once you've written a couple of hundred songs, the new, the fresh ideas are a little scarcer, you know. And and I, for one, I don't want to just rewrite the same songs over and over. So I think that some of my songs are, are very recognizable from... from prior stuff I've done as, as far as the style and some others are, are a different style you know but uh, it's, it's hard to say it's, it's sort of a conglomerate mix you know <laughs> I have I have a vocal coach that I see and I gave her a, a disc with about oh, 15 or 16 unrecorded songs you know unreleased songs or thing. and she was going through she would listen to about half and she said she called me and she said don't you ever write a bad song and I went well gee Chris I heard you that. <laughs> and then she called me back about an hour later and she said never mind I found one <laughs> because there's there's a there's a reggae song that I wrote and it's not that it's reggae that's not it but the song is called To Get Some Love and and the first verse the lyric is you got it I want it give it to me <laughs> And and she found that to be offensive and a bit outside what she expected from Rick Roberts. So you know, so I write a lot of kinds of stuff. You know? well, what can you say? Before we gotta go, uh, I want to ask you. Okay, a question. It's a two part question. Okay. One, what do you think when you play live and you've played live throughout your career is Firefall's most not biggest hit but most appreciated by the audience? And two. What is your favorite Firefall song? My favorite Firefall song? Well, I have, it'd be hard to split it to one, but I like uh, some of the deeper cuts. They're some of my favorites only. The one of the more successful ones is also one of my favorites. They're two separate categories, as you said. Uh, I love Larry Song Cinderella. And uh, I also love a couple of his, his uh, quieter ballads. Uh, you know, we're doing one called Love Is It All, which I think is a great song too. But he has a couple of others. And one called, uh, uh, well, there was one called Business is Business, but that's not. Only Time Will Tell is a good song. And a song of mine that I love, I love it from the day I wrote it, is a song called Dolphin's Lullaby. And, uh, you know, that, that of, the, of the more successful ones, I like You're the Woman the Least. <laughs> and I like uh, I like the lyric of Just Remember I Love You. And I like the musical feel of Strange Way a lot. And we had a song later on called Headed for a Fall, which I, I like a lot. It's, I, I'm not sure if my opinion about that is influenced by the fact that it was written about my mom. Okay. And... Uh, and she had a battle with alcoholism, which she won, I'm happy to say. But uh, she spent the last 17 years of her life sober and helping other people trying to make the change from alcohol to not, you know. Um, and uh, like that, but, but that's another one. And there, there are a few of them. I, you know, I love the music of uh, Mexico. And... Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm happy to say that, that I think Firefall put out a lot of quality music on its first, at least its first four albums. Uh, you know, and because you know we we approached it from it's funny the, the, another of my my little philosophies here. The whole music was just changed majorly when the Beatles arrived because not not their overwhelming slam in the aisles popularity but the fact that before that a record album the the artist they were told mostly by the record label what to record 
and they had on their their current hit single, their upcoming single, maybe a flyer, and the rest was total and complete fill, filler. It could have been an argument between your grandparents when you recorded it and put it on. It wouldn't have made any difference. Nobody does say anything but the, the main things. The Beatles came along and started putting out records where every cut on the thing was, was worthwhile, could stand alone as a good song. And that changed the game. Plus, they were writing their own material, which was another game changer. It opened the door for a lot of brilliant artists and a lot of people who really shouldn't have should have taken up songwriting in the first place. But, you know, two, two way three, double edged sword, all that stuff. But, uh, so the thing is that, that you know, uh, making a record album from that point on, you wanted all the songs to be strong. You didn't want to have just your couple of songs, strong songs, and then fill the rest with, you know, whatever, or just some that, hey, this is fun, you know. That that might have been fun for the band, but it wasn't really fun for the listener, you know. Well, I, so. you, I, want, I want to thank you for coming on. And uh, people, just, you know, the, the website, your website is rickrobertsandlarryburnett.com, and I know your tour information's there. Yes. And now you have an older website that says it's Rick Roberts Music. Do you still use that site? I do. I you know I don't necessarily go on it every day or anything like that. But uh, you know because I have never. In fact, when I was writing my first book, uh, someone asked me said, uh, "How's it how's it coming with your book?" I said, "Well, they 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 called they told me from the uh, the uh, literary agent standpoint said, you know." Of course, you're real good, but you're not a household name. And I said, I know I, I was never a household name, man. And, uh, you know, the, the thing is that having that knowledge in my pocket, uh, Rick Harper's music was never, you know, a, a game changer. Big thing. So I refer to it, I go to it and check it out periodically. I check out to see who's written and what, and I try to, you know, with messages or notes to be whatever, try to respond and things like that. So it's active, but it's not not overly active. <laughs> well, okay, well, I want to thank you. So people, also people, go out and uh, go buy some Exile music, man. Even if it's Exile's greatest hits, just go listen to their music. You know, you younger people, you'll dig the music. You know, and a lot of this, this stuff's romantic. I'm going to tell you, I'm sure there's a lot of babies made to Exile music. So sit there and uh, check out Rick Roberts. Uh, go to my website, coopertalk.net. I have over 750 episodes. Email me, cooper at coopertalk.net. And if you listen on iTunes, I'm also on Stitcher, Spotify, TuneIn Radio, and YouTube. If you listen on U iTunes, Please stop by, give me a five-star review, and write something nice. So give it up for Rick Roberts. I'm Steve Cooper. I'm only as hip as my guest. Don't forget, drink your water, eat your vegetables, take your vitamins, and I'll talk to you guys next time.